Today we're in Philippians chapter 4. Uh, in chapter 1 of Philippians, Paul gave us a perspective for Christian outlook in a dark world. And he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He said, I win either way. And in chapter 2, Paul says, as long as you live, here's the pattern for Christian living. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, the attitude of humility. And in chapter three, Paul told us, pursue Christ like you're an elite athlete in both your preparation and in your performance of the tasks that God put you here for. And in chapter four today, Paul says, don't be anxious as this dark world swirls around you. Stand firm in the Lord. Rejoice all the time. So we begin in verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, because they have the same heavenly Father, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. Paul sounds like some of you do when you're talking about your grandchildren. You whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Stand firm in his power and strength. You know, life could be difficult for Christians in this Roman society. So Paul was encouraging them to stand strong when things got bad, when panic set in, when temptation to defect from their faith got strong. Our temptation to defect from our faith today here in McKinney is different than Philippi of the Roman Empire, but the message is still for us, for our families, for our youth. It's still the same. Stand firm in the Lord when you're threatened by a dark world. Stand firm in the Lord when you're tempted by sin and by the evil one. Verse 2, I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntychia to be of the same mind in the Lord. So apparently we've got these two energetic Christian women of position in the church who had a difference that they had surfaced and it became a distraction and a diversion to the ministry of the church. He says either reconcile and come to an agreement or agree to disagree, but move on, put it behind you. Adopt the mind of Christ which brings unity and priority to Christ and his work. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, perhaps the you he's addressing is Epaphroditus, by whom he sent the letter back to the, the Philippians, who's the pastor of the church, and perhaps he's addressing a man named Zizekus, whose name means true companion. And perhaps he's addressing someone else that he recognized as a true peacemaker. He says, help these women with counsel and advice since they've contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. He says, both of these people love Jesus. Both of them have been my big supporters and both of them have been strong witnesses to Christ as Lord. And he said, and along with Clement and the rest of the co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. So in verse four, he begins, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. He said, there's always reason to rejoice, no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the trials or the tribulation, no matter how you feel. For us today in the US, how we feel becomes one of Satan's biggest barriers to rejoicing in the Lord. I feel bad. I feel that's not good. I don't feel like that. I will say it again for emphasis, rejoice. Let your humility and gentleness be evident to everyone. The Lord is near. Psalm 145, 18, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, 
and ever-present help in trouble. So not only is the Lord near you all the time, he's coming soon. So he says in verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. Like my mother said, why pray when you can be anxious? Don't fret. Don't worry. Don't be weighed down. Is there anything that doesn't cover? And Paul makes it sound so easy. Why is it so hard to, for us to obey? We live in a world of fear and loss and health and money and relationships and life and expectations. We live in a world of disappointment. We just stopped Paul in mid-sentence here to question this mandate that he had for us not to be anxious. So let's look at back at what he just said and then we'll finish the sentence. I will say it again for emphasis, rejoice. Let your humility and gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. First of all, to avoid anxiety, don't be so grasping. Don't hold on to these things of the earth. Don't be so possessive and controlling about life. He says, the earth is not your inheritance. Second, he says, rejoice. Jesus is coming soon. Now for the rest of the sentence. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, in some translation, petition is uh, called supplication, which is a stronger Greek word for a form of prayer like begging with persistence, with importunity, always giving thanksgiving, present your request to God. Turn every care, every worry, every anxiety into a prayer, Paul says. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul said, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstance, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You may have wondered how anyone can pray continually. First, we've studied recently uh, things that may give you a partial answer. First, we have here that you should turn every care, every worry, every anxiety into a prayer. Then we have the words, in every situation. We can talk to God about anything and everything. You don't have to make an oratory of it. You just talk to God about it. Then in our lesson in Philippians 3, Paul gave us an example of an opportunity to pray when he said, every time I think of you, I give thanks. And it reminds me to pray for you. So uh, Paul's recommendations may not consume every waking minute, but it does give you thought about how to pray. How many times a day do you react with anxiety or fear or worry that something doesn't go like you expected or like you wanted? How many times a day do you have a fear? Or how many times a day does a person come to mind for any reason? A friend, a family member, a church member, a government leader, something in the news. Every time I think of you, I give thanks. And it reminds me to pray for you. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard, will act as a sentinel over your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What a way to live. A picture of love as doing. A picture of love in action. In Philippians 2, we discovered that the pattern for Christian living was to have the mind of Christ. Do you see how that talking things over with God lets you learn what is the mind of Christ? This fellowship allows Christ to share his mind with you. Dear Father, I come to you with everything that I am and have, and I desire 
and exchange it for everything that you are and have for me. Verse 8. Finally, brothers, and then what follows is a list of six adjectives that picture Christian ideals and describe moral excellence. These are the same words that are pertinent today as we're confronted by a world, a world with filth and slime on TV, in books, in music, all in the name of realism, whatever is true. Christ says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So whatever is true aligns with the mind of God. Whatever is noble in the sight of men, the way you walk, the way you act, the way you treat others, the way you dress, whatever is just between man and man, between God and man, or whatever is pure in word and deed, or chaste in both your actions and the way you talk, whatever is lovely, whatever increases love and friendship among men, whatever is lovely in the sight of God, whatever is admirable, what is of good report, what strengthens the reputation of the Christian, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think, ponder, meditate about such things. Make these things a habit for your thoughts. Paul says this is a choice you have and you have to make it. Do you choose things that are heavenly and holy or do you choose the darkness of the world? In the 23rd chapter of Proverbs, it says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. Worry leads to fear. Fear leads to darkness. Noble thoughts give way to noble deeds. Verse 9. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice as a habit. And the God of peace will be with you. Paul says that you have in your heart what you have in your heart. Those are the things you allow yourself to think about. He says that's the real you. Paul had plenty of things to choose from. On one side he could worry about his health. He actually prayed to God about healing him of a problem that he had. He could have worried about the coming trial. It was going to cost him his life, probably. He could have worried about the lack of comfort. He was in a dungeon, the threat of death. He could have worried about that being in prison was a limitation to his ministry. On the other hand, we see that Paul did choose to give thanks in all things, to recall and pray for those he ministered with and to, to fellowship with Christ. So to choose the things of God, choose holy character, and then let it show itself in your behavior, he says. I rejoice greatly, that's verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last your concern for me bloomed afresh. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. So Paul is uh, being appreciative of the gifts that the church sent. Apparently there had been a period in which their support had dropped off. Now it was renewed and he attributed it to the fact that he was so far from them. Have you found places where your support has dropped off in God's work and you give reason for them to rejoice over your rekindled interest, your bloomed afresh in support of the Lord's work? He said, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. 
For I did learn long ago in my experiences to be content with whatever the circumstances. He says, I know what it is to be abased. He says, I've been run over before. I've been trampled on. I've been put down. I've been treated with indignity. I've survived mean conditions. I've lived without enough food and water. And he says, and I know what it is to excel. I've been esteemed by me and I've been showered with affluence. I've been garnering, garnering praise. I've learned to live in the midst of plenty. And he says, and I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether I'm well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want, I have the strength to do all things that God gives me strength for. The first part of that verse without the last part sounds like arrogance. You know, we recently studied in Daniel that when King Nebuchadnezzar said, look what I have built with my own hands. God gave him the mind of an ox eating grass in the field until he humbled himself. In the power of Christ, I can do all things. Whatever burden in your life is yours, carry it joyfully in Christ. I can do God assigned work that he puts me in. One of the great sermons of Martin Luther King is called the street sweeper. He said, if God makes you a street sweeper, you be the best street sweeper there is. Yes, it was good of you to share in my troubles. I remember when I was a child hearing people who received gifts respond to the giver with, oh, you didn't have to do that, or oh, you shouldn't have. It didn't mean they were about to give it back. And like those people, Paul doesn't discourage them from continuing to show favor on him. And he continues to use it as an opportunity to praise them for their generosity. Moreover, as your you Philippines know, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church sh shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you and you only. So Paul uses an accounting term that was associated with commerce here giving and receiving. He's saying that the people of Philippi recognized the value of his ministry and they kept things in balance by supporting physical needs while he supported their spiritual needs. For even when I left Philippi and went to Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. And apparently they did it one more more than one time when he went from Thessalonica to Corinth. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is more to be credited to your account. More than the blessing Paul received from the gifts themselves was the blessing he received from seeing them developing into mature Christians through their act of generosity. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I'm amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent. They're a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God and my God will meet need. The Greek word here is the root for our word plenty and my God will fill up every need. My God will fill up all your needs according to the abundant riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. In the Jewish tradition, this phrase was said like a prayer. Not that Paul could fulfill their needs, but his testimony is that God could and God would. So do we offer this prayer to those around us today? Is it our testimony to those who need the God we serve? 
my God will fill up your need. In the New Testament, we have the story of Christ feeding the 5,000. And when they were all fed and they all were filled, there's that word, filled up, there were still 12 baskets that the disciples hadn't distributed. There is the picture of God with his abundant resources. Then there's this Old Testament story about God meeting needs in the second book of Kings. In the fourth chapter, there came to Elisha the prophet, a poor widow, and she had two sons and they were being sold into slavery to pay for the debt that the poor widow owed. And she came to Elisha in her distress. What shall I do? She said. Her two boys were being taken into slavery, sold to pay a debt. And Elisha said, go borrow all of the empty vessels from every one of your neighbors. Then he said, take that little cruise of oil that you have, close your door and pour it out and pour it out and fill it up and fill it up. And so she took all of the vessels she could borrow from her neighbors, all the pots and the pans and the jars, and she put them all in the house and she closed the door and she took that little vial of oil and filled them up, filled them up, filled them up, filled them up, till every vessel she could borrow was filled to brimming. And then Elisha said, now go sell the oil and pay your debt and there's enough for you to live on the rest. So what God invites us to do here, he says, take all of your needs, all of those empty vessels and place them before the Lord and ask God to fill them up. Answer every need. Ask God for all of it. If you don't have a need, God can't help you. If you don't have an empty vessel, there's nothing to fill up. But in fact, you probably have a new need, more than one new need every day. You have physical needs, spiritual needs, financial needs, medical needs, material needs, emotional needs, and my God will meet all of your needs according to the abundant riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Paul says, when you pray, ask him, sign the request with G Jesus' name. He said, it's like a blank check with Christ's name as the signature. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. He says, greet God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Can you just imagine? Here's Juliana that waits on Caesar's wife. She says she loves you. Here's Crassius, the cook, in Caesar's kitchen. He says, may God bless you. The soldier in pod 23 says, send them my greetings. And Plutus, the historian, and his family say, Blessings on you all. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And be it so. So the homework assignment. I'm going to give you a homework assignment. A homework assignment for this week is this. Every time you think of someone, give thanks for them. And then if that brings to mind a need that they have, pray for it. Ask God to fill up their need. And every time a fear or worry comes into your mind this week, talk to God about it. Let God give you his mind. He'll exchange your mind for his mind regarding the situation. And then come back next week with testimonies about how God kept his promise. That's the lesson for today.